Stanford University. There are various kinds of catastrophic events that could happen in Earth history. Very few of them are catastrophic in a way that could lead to a mass extinction of life. In fact, the only one we really have confidence in is an impact by a big comet or asteroid. And so, from one perspective at least, the impact history of the Earth, uh, the degree to which we've been battered by cosmic projectiles, is actually the most important external or cosmic influence on the Earth's environment and hence on the conditions for life. There's one exception, and that is if the sun has changed in brightness over time, that would obviously make a big difference. And the astrophysicists tell us <coughs> with great confidence that the sun was 30% cooler, less luminous, uh, when the Earth formed. Now, if you just take that literally, that would mean that the Earth would freeze solid. The oceans would freeze, part of the atmosphere would freeze out. It would be very hard to have life. So you have to work out a scenario in which there's something compensating for this cooler sun. And the thing that compensates, <coughs> we're pretty sure, is an enhanced greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect heats the surface, so that even though the total amount of energy hitting the Earth from the sun is less, more of it's trapped by the atmosphere. And you can end up with, with a surface that's uh, fairly comfortable. It's a little worse when we look at Mars, because there's evidence that four billion years ago, Mars had a very Earth-like climate. It too had oceans, blue sky, clouds, rain that fell, at least for a little while. Well, Mars is substantially farther from the sun than we are. So now you have this real contradiction. The sun was fainter, and yet a planet further out was still warm enough to have liquid water. <coughs> and quite frankly, no one entirely understands this. It's one of the big mysteries in talking about the habitability of planets. And we've given it the name the faint young sun paradox. It's a paradox because when we look at the history of the Earth and Mars, it was very warm in the past, and yet when we look at the history of the sun, as astronomers understand it, the sun was fainter. So whatever goes on to consider a habitable environment, <coughs> it in part must be a balance between external things, like the brightness of the sun, the amount of energy hitting, and the planet's own climate, and in particular the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect can make a huge difference in the surface conditions on a planet. Have you talked about Venus, Earth, and Mars? Uh, no, that's going to be Thursday. Pardon? Thursday. Thursday, okay. Well, I won't uh, try to take away from that, but the fact is that Venus has a huge greenhouse effect and a surface that's, that's hot enough to melt lead. It's a horrible place. It's hellish. And it's not hellish because it's closer to the sun, although it is. It's hellish because the greenhouse effect produces this kind of severe surface heating. But somehow or another, the Earth has managed to balance its greenhouse effect against changes in solar brightness so that the climate has been fairly stable for at least the last four billion years. Some excursions, no doubt, but not enough to boil the oceans and kill everything, and not enough to freeze everything solid. Somehow we've maintained a climate that was suitable for life. And so when we talk about life on other worlds, it's actually key to remember that we're not just talking about the instantaneous conditions, how hot is it or how could there be liquid water right now, but the stability over long periods of time. Uh, and if the stars are changing in brightness, if other things are going on, you're putting a much more demanding question on habitability. It's not just, is it habitable now, but has it been habitable through the whole history of the evolution of life? <coughs> well, conditions do change slowly, and species do go extinct. 
It may surprise you, it certainly surprised me when I first learned it, that more than 99% of all the species that have lived on Earth are now extinct. And that's just talking about the, the sort of things that are big enough to leave fossils. We know very much less about the history of the microbial world and even less about the history of viruses. Uh, when you think about who inhabits our planet, we all think of big things that you can see with your eyes, plants, animals, birds, fish, you know, the whole, the whole array of things, um, pond scum and uh, molds and all of those. Those are all the big life that you can see with your eye that we're aware of. They do not dominate the planet. I'm sure you know this. There's more biomass in the microbes, individual little microscopic things added together, than there is in the big things. And some people think that there's more mass in viruses, which are much smaller yet, than in the microbes. So while we talk about evolution and we talk about the history of the large critters on Earth, most of the biomass is invisible in the form of microbes and viruses, and we actually know very little about their history. Uh, we don't know how often new species arise. We don't know how often extinctions take place. We don't know how sensitive the microbial population is, for instance, to, uh, to changing conditions, habitability. So I'm going to put that aside, and I'm going to talk about what we can measure and what we can study in the fossil record, and that is the history of creatures that leave fossils. That automatically excludes most of the history of the Earth because the oldest fossils are less than one billion years old. So there may have been extinctions. There was certainly a great deal of evolutionary history that took place back then. Uh, and we really know very little bit about, about what happened. The one thing we do know is that very early in the solar system, the Earth, the Moon, and all the planets were being bombarded by comets and asteroids at a much, much higher rate than today. It still happens, but it happens very gradually compared to the past. Just to give you an example from the moon, um, 40 years ago, we flew five orbiters around the moon, they were called lunar orbiter, that photographed the surface, some of it at very high resolution. And now we have a modern lunar orbiter, LRO, Lunar uh, Reconnaissance Orbiter, which has as good or better resolution and is photographing the surface 40 years later. As the new pictures come in and we reprocess the old ones, we're going to compare them and see how many new craters have formed in those 40 years. There will be a few because there's a continuing bombardment of the surface by rocks. And one of the best ways we can actually determine the rate at which this bombardment is taking place will be by comparing these pictures with a 40-year baseline. But it is happening. It does happen. And four billion years ago, it happened at a rate at least 10,000 times greater. So if now there's a bad impact, say, every million years uh, that, uh, that might lead to some extinction, back then it would have been every 100 years. And probably would have made the Earth uninhabitable periodically. Not all the time. But an impact comes, you, you do terrible things, you boil away the oceans, you kill off nearly everything. In a few centuries, the water goes back into the oceans, starts over. But if, if you're not careful, then there's going to be another one and another one. And the conditions simply weren't suitable for the, uh, the origin of life. And we know about that late heavy bombardment, not, not by studying the Earth, but by studying the moon. Because the moon has very little geology, no weathering. It records the early history of the solar system, which is effectively gone from the Earth. It's one of the great virtues of studying the moon, not just as an object in itself, but as a window on the early Earth. It preserves the record of impacts and craters, which has been erased on our planet. But let me move to 
more recent events and talk about the way impacts can produce mass extinctions. You all know what an extinction is. So that's it. You think of it by species. In some species, it ends. There's no member of that species left. There's nothing reproducing. There's nothing carrying on. A mass extinction is usually defined as a situation in which more than half of the species go extinct essentially at one time. <coughs> That's a pretty traumatic thing. That means for more than half of the species on Earth, you have to kill them all. There can't be even one surviving pair uh, to have little ones and continue. And so it doesn't happen very often. In fact, in the history of the last 500 million years, which is, is uh, what we can study the fossil record for, it's happened five times, roughly every 100 million years, although it's not periodic. About five times, there's been this collapse, and more than half the species have gone extinct, and then gradually, over tens of millions of years, built back up. Um, Overall, there's been no increase in the number of species. There's been no increase in the carrying capacity of the Earth. Uh, when I was in you know, grade school level, I remember things somehow that, that life started with just a few species and a few individuals and gradually got more and more and more and more complex, you know, just over time until where we are now. That's not the way it works. It's been pretty steady for the last 500 million years, except for these intervals when something comes along and really screws up the planet and produces a mass extinction. And we kind of like to understand what causes that because it's been the dominant effect, the evolutionary effect on our planet. The reason is partly that after a mass extinction, when you've wiped out more than half the species and probably more than 99% of the critters, um, you've created a wonderful opportunity for those that survive. Suddenly there's plenty of food, there's plenty of room, there's plenty of space. And so the major part of speciation of new species come after a mass extinction. So what causes a mass extinction? The only one of the five that we know is the one I'm sure you've all heard of, the one 65 million years ago that killed the dinosaurs. That's the most recent, the end Cretaceous mass extinction. And uh, it's easy, easiest to study. There are the most fossils. There's the most evidence. But it was still a remarkable discovery, one of the great scientific discoveries of the 20th century, when a scientific team led by the father and son of, of Louis and Walter Alvarez over in Berkeley analyzed the boundary between the, the older material and the new. You know, you're looking at a stratification of rocks. So there are older rocks below. There is a layer about an inch thick that's distinctly different, and then new rocks up above. And in that inch thick layer lies the answer to what caused the mass extinction. Now, let me, let me explain something that I'm sure is not obvious. Almost all of this work has been done in marine sediments, sediments that were laid down in oceans. We know much less about what happened on the land. But where sediments were laid down in oceans, or even in lakes, uh, they're preserved, you got a nice layer, and best of all, you have lots and lots and lots of fossils. Fossils of the microscopic creatures that make up the, uh, the plankton in the ocean. So in a, a thimbleful of material, you can have thousands and thousands of tiny fossils you put under the microscope, and you can see these little shells and their different shapes, and even identify what the species were. So it doesn't take but a thimbleful of material to analyze the whole population of what was going on in the ocean. When you look below this boundary, take a thimbleful of material and get a certain number of species, and then you look above only 10% of those from below continue above. And the place where the change takes place is absolutely sharp. It's instantaneous geologically. And the key lies in this layer of material between the older 
and the younger, a point in time when there was some traumatic, violent change in the, uh, in the population of the oceans. And what the Alvarez team did was take this material from the boundary layer, analyze it using all the high-tech ability of, of modern nuclear physics uh, so that they could detect in detail what was in it, and discovered, well, the most famous is the metal iridium. But they discovered a bunch of things in that layer that are extremely rare on Earth. Does any of you own a platinum ring? Well, maybe someday you will. <laughs> uh, platinum is valuable because it's rare. Gold is valuable because it's rare. Most of the things that are valuable are valuable because there isn't much of them. Iridium and platinum and these metals that were found in this boundary layer are extremely rare on Earth because at the beginning of the Earth, when it differentiated, when it heated, when it was liquid, these heavy metals all went to the core, or almost all. So they're not so rare in the universe as a whole, but they are extremely rare in the surface of the Earth. And the Alvarez made the logical conclusion. In retrospect, it seems so elegant and simple. They said, well, if we have all this material that's rare on the Earth, but is present there, it must have come from an extraterrestrial source. And we actually know that the meteorites that fall and the, the asteroids do have a mixture that includes lots of these metals. They are not differentiated. They have not separated out. They said, well, at this point in time, when a mass extinction took place, there was an input of extraterrestrial material. How could that happen? Well, the simplest way it can happen is for the Earth to be hit by a comet or asteroid. And the material from that impact spread all the way around the Earth, diluted and everything else, and still retained the signature of elements that are very rare on Earth. And they put the whole story together. They discovered the, the composition of this layer. They discovered that it was made of rare materials. They knew that those materials were common in space, just not on Earth. And they said all it would take is a single rock, meteorite, asteroid, whatever you want to call it, about 15 kilometers in diameter hitting the Earth, and it could bring in all this material. And what would happen if something 15 kilometers across hit the Earth? We're talking about something about the, the size of, uh, of the bay. Um, it would make a crater. It would make a very big crater, in fact. And it would loft material into the atmosphere that would, in the stratosphere that would block out the sun and would plunge the Earth into blackness like we can't even imagine. For months, not a single photon of sunlight would get through to the surface. And it would be global because the atmospheric circulation would carry this dust around. And that could produce a mass extinction. And then, hey, guess what? This is exactly the point at which the dinosaurs went extinct, too. And a lot of other creatures. We talk about the mammals having survived it, but most species of mammals went extinct at the same point. Everything went extinct. Uh, most plants went extinct. Uh, so it was a global catastrophe, and they suggested that might be due to an impact of a comet or asteroid. Well, that shook up the scientific world. It really did. And boy, did it make the paleontologists who were studying dinosaurs mad. Because they devoted their whole life to trying to understand dinosaurs and how they worked and what might have happened. And here comes this damn physicist and damn geologist from another department telling them that their, what, their life studies are not worth anything, that the dinosaurs all went extinct at this one point, and it was a cosmic projectile that did it. They, they, over at Berkeley, there were people who wouldn't talk to each other in the halls over this. Uh, and in fact, there are still a few old timers who just kind of turn red and, and, and their jaw muscles tighten at the very mention of, of this, because it was a case of people coming from another discipline, from outside, a geologist and a physicist, 
overturning the basic dogma of what had happened to the dinosaurs. Before that, nobody knew why the dinosaurs went extinct. And there were some very bizarre ideas. I remember, again, I'm thinking back to grade school, we were told, well, the little mammals ate the eggs of the dinosaurs. <laughs> and that's why they went extinct. Uh, there's a wonderful Larson cartoon that shows three dinosaurs smoking, and the thing said, what really made the dinosaurs go extinct? <laughs> um, you know, but they, they really, uh, someone looked up, there were like 40 different suggestions the scientists had made as to what that caused the dinosaurs to go extinct, and none of them had included a cosmic projectile. So it took a while uh, for this to be accepted. As I said, there are a few old timers that still don't accept it. There's a former director of the paleontology lab at, at Berkeley who still, uh, who still, you don't want to bring up the subject for me, let's put it that way. Um, perfectly nice guy otherwise. Um, but how could you verify this? How could you verify this theory? Well, the first thing is that if, this, if it happened the way they said, this deposit of extraterrestrial dust must be global. They had looked at only one place, rocks from Gubbio, Italy, a beautiful little hill town. Uh, they still go back there and have a meeting every summer because it's such a nice place to have a meeting. Uh, but they had found it there, and yet they made this suggestion that it was global. That wherever this impact had taken place, they had spread the dust over the whole Earth. And so immediately, other people started going out and finding other places where you could see this, this exposure of rock at the, uh, the end Cretaceous. And every one of them found more of this material in the other places. So that was a wonderful confirmation. Next question was, well, where's the crater? If the, if the Earth was hit and by something this big, there ought to be a crater 200 kilometers in diameter on the Earth. And at that time, no one knew of any crater that big, uh, let alone one identified that took place 65 million years ago. It could have been that we would not have found the crater. You all know about plate tectonics, the way the Earth's uh, surface is constantly being reworked. And the land areas are pretty stable, except for earthquakes and mountain building things, but ocean is constantly recycled. So if it had fallen in the ocean, there was about a 50-50 chance that in the last 65 million years, that part of the ocean would have been recycled and the evidence gone forever. But by luck, that wasn't the way it happened. And they began to look for other hints as to where on Earth might this impact have taken place. Um, and they went to Texas and found deposits five meters thick of gravel that were apparently deposited by a big wave at that time. They went to Haiti and found all sorts of strange deposits there, up to 15 meters thick. Not just a little thin thing an inch across that was at the boundary layer in Gubbio, Italy. Um, so they began to probe around the Caribbean. Could it have happened in the Caribbean? The worst, the worst actual physical damage from the impact seemed to be there. And there weren't any, no obvious craters, but, uh, but some people began to focus on an area in the Yucatan Peninsula. And one of the key stories, I like this story because it's again, just scientists being clever. You know, you work hard, most of the time you don't make discoveries, most of the time it's not clever, but sometimes something really works. How many of you have been to the, uh, the Mayan sites in the Yucatan? Good. Do you remember the cenote? The cenote are these, uh, these, I won't say wells, these big ponds that are in the limestone where there's water. And they tended to build their cities near cenote because of the access of water. You could lower a bucket in and get it out. And someone here at Ames, looking at, uh, at photographs, noticed that the cenote, are, first of all, he knows simply of the old Mayan sites, clustered in an arc across the Yucatan. There were not many outside, there were not many in, but there was an arc. 
and concluded that could be the rim of the crater because you get a weakening when there's a crater and subsequent collapse and that would be the kind of location where you might millions of years later form the cenote and that was right eventually they found that it had landed just right on the boundary between the land and the sea in the Yucatan at a little village with a Mayan name of Chicxulub and so it's called the Chicxulub crater easier to pronounce than to spell and uh, it's about 200 kilometers in diameter. There's hardly anything left on the surface because over 65 million years, it's been under in the ocean most of the time, and it's had thousands of feet of limestone deposited on top of it. But you can drill down and find the place where the impact took place, the melted rock, the broken material, and the whole thing. And that confirmed it. Made it absolutely clear that this impact had really taken place we knew where it had hit, we knew how big the crater was, therefore we knew approximately how big the projectile was. And uh, we knew it had led to a profound change in the population of life on Earth. One thing that came out of the subsequent work was that the dinosaurs were doing just fine. They were not in decline. It wasn't as though things were changing and most were dying and the rest were under stress and therefore just a little push had them over the edge. They were doing fine. There were about 40 species of dinosaurs then. We say they ruled the world. I'm not sure what that means, but they were certainly the biggest things around. The T-Rex is you know, a prime example. And yet, in an instant, in an afternoon, they were all killed without warning, without doing anything bad to deserve it. Uh, and that kind of shakes people up when you think about it. That something external from outside without warning, without anything else, could come along and do a terrible, terrible damage to the habitability of the Earth, at least temporarily. The actual thing that caused the extinction, we now think we understand pretty well. It wasn't just the blast. The explosion, the crater, the rocks thrown around would have killed anything within several thousand kilometers. Uh, but this was an extinction that affected the whole Earth. So what was there that could go beyond that and produce a global catastrophe? And there are two things. We aren't sure the balance between them. But first is the crater itself, the forming this crater 1,000 kilometers across and 35 kilometers deep, you excavate an incredible amount of material, pulverized rock, and you throw it completely out of the atmosphere, but it doesn't have escape velocity. It can't escape from the Earth. So after a while, it starts falling back down and re-enters the atmosphere. And all the energy that was originally in the explosion and went up above is released as heat when it comes back into the atmosphere. This is a meteor shower like you can't imagine. A meteor shower that if you were standing there looking at it, you would go blind instantly just from the heat of this re-entering material. So it produced a global firestorm. Forests, grasslands burst into flame all over the world. Um, didn't affect the oceans, of course, but anything on land was in bad trouble, even if it was on the other side of the earth. And then that same material, part of it remaining in the stratosphere, blocks the incoming sunlight. And so it gets cold, photosynthesis stops, and now you have the tragedy for the, the ocean. The ocean didn't care about this brief, brief flash of heat. But once you've stopped photosynthesis and the, and the uh, ocean food system collapses, that would be what would have produced the mass extinction that you saw originally in, in the little uh, critters in the ocean. Uh, it all happened together. It happened without warning, and it changed the population of the Earth. One easy thing to say is if that hadn't happened, we would not be here. Our ancestors, the early mammals, have been around for tens of millions of years, and frankly, we're not doing real well. 
than compared to dinosaurs. They got eaten a lot. Uh, they, they hid in holes and scurried around on the ground. They were about the size, you know, of a, of a hamster or a, uh, or a rat or a mouse. Uh, and yet they gave rise to all the mammals on Earth, including us. That would never have happened if the dinosaurs hadn't been wiped out. The kind of trees we have now, the beautiful trees of our forest, probably would never have evolved if it hadn't been that the old forests were killed. Uh, so here you have this, this new speciation happening after the impact catastrophe. And uh, I shouldn't say we wouldn't be here, because the fact is that uh, we might be. We might be having this class. It would be in a different shaped room. The chairs would be built differently. We would be dinosaurs. There's nothing to say that dinosaurs, given another 65 million years, might not have evolved just as much intelligence as we have. Like if you go see a movie like Jurassic Park, you may think they were already pretty close then. Uh, so I'm not even going to tell you it was a change for the better. Maybe the smart dinosaurs would have been better for the planet than smart people. But at any rate, it really did make a difference. And it's changed your perspective on some of the dynamics of evolution. Let me put it this way. You all know what Darwinian evolution is, right? Everybody's heard of the survival of the fittest. That's kind of a catchphrase. But, but what it implies is that there's constant competition for resources, that any creature that has some advantage, some genetic advantage over others, is more likely to reproduce. And you're talking now about a very gradual change over time, millions, tens of millions of years. And you know, we always say that the cheetah will run faster and the giraffe will have a long neck so it can reach the, uh, the, uh, the leaves up above and things like this. It's a gradual competition, gradual change. And you can see the kind of things that an animal that ran faster or was taller or was resistant to disease or was smarter or whatever, would eventually have an advantage. That made no difference in surviving the impact. So what if you ran fast? You couldn't run away from it. So what if you had a long neck for, for eating uh, uh, the uh, leaves on trees if all the trees were gone? Uh, it changed the rules. And all the evolutionary progress, if you want to think of it that way, the evolutionary change, the slow things, that had been happening, it was like pushing, pushing reset on your computer. You started over. And it turned out that the survivors, in many cases, were mammals because they were little and they could hide. They could go down in their holes. They could hibernate for a year. If you were big, you did not survive. On the whole earth, no animal much bigger than a cat survived that impact. And so it wasn't the smart ones. It wasn't the ones that could run fast. It wasn't any of those things. It was the ones that were small and could hide in a hole. And uh, it's kind of sobering to think that uh, we think we know what makes fitness, what makes us fit, what makes animals fit. But we have to recognize that occasionally the rules change. And it's still Darwinian. It's still survival of the fittest. There's no change in that. But the rules change because survival now is in a completely different environment, a post-Holocaust environment, rather than the sort of standard thing that, uh, that people have been, that, that creatures have been living in. So let me stop a moment and ask for questions. When am I supposed to stop, Lynn? Oh, about 5.05. Yeah. So what questions can I answer about the Cretaceous mass extinction? Yeah. <laughs> what was left for them to eat? Well, there was lots of dead dinosaur meeting, meat. <laughs> but what happened with the plants was that the plants that survived were those that had hard seed cases and could lie fallow for a year until the dust fell out and rain started falling again. 
And so it wasn't that there were no forests afterwards. It's just that they were made of the plants that were able to survive a year or a fire or whatever. And we still have them. When you, when a, after a forest fire, the composition of the forest changes and a bunch of whole new things come up because they're the seeds that were able to survive the fire. In fact, there are a certain number of seeds that need some of the chemicals released by fire mm -hmm. in order to germinate. Mm -hmm. it's, it's part of nature's backup system for forests because there are fires that come along and you, you want to have something that will, uh, will cause the forest to regenerate itself. I mean, I'm talking anthropogenically. That's not right, but that is the way it works. Yeah? Um, what sizes of animals would have been in like, the water system? Ah. The, it, we don't understand the water system as well. Uh, clearly, the water provided protection. And one of the largest critters that, that survived actually were the ancient crocodilians the crocodiles and, and, uh, and alligators, which uh, probably could go underwater in the mud and manage to survive that way. In the oceans, uh, the ones that survived best were the scavengers. Sharks loved it. There was plenty for them to eat. The bottom feeders, you know, there a lot of, a lot of uh, animals in the ocean survived. Um, but if they depend on zooplankton, if they depend on a continuing diet, of, of diatoms that depend on, on photosynthesis, they were in trouble. It's, a, it's an interesting subject, and I don't mean to have all the answers at all. One of the best ways you can study the environmental effect of the impact is to study the pattern of extinction and survival. And for each one that survived, you say, why did that survive? What, what did it have that allowed it to survive over its neighbors? And there's always just an element of luck. You know, when you're talking about uh, one of the best strategies for survival is to have lots of them. If, an, if a species is, I mean, cockroaches are a beautiful example. Cockroaches did just fine because there are cockroaches everywhere. And you can kill off 99% of them and there's still enough cockroaches to take over the world. <laughs> you know, it's a... Uh, it's creatures like that that are very good survivors. But it's partly just by sheer numbers, by being distributed over a lot of space. Yeah? So instead of moving on to, I guess, the next topic, but when succession started to reoccur, wasn't there some residual effects from that clim in climate and uh, what was we don't happening know. that we don't would have resulted in more competition? We don't know. That, that's another very interesting research question. We kind of know what happened in the first year or two after the impact. And some say that there was a rebound, that, uh, that the temperatures went up again because of more CO2. I don't think we know what, by, by, on the million year time scale, everything stabilized back. But there again, the pattern of what was really happening afterwards, I don't think we have enough evidence to know. Um, if photosynthesis was shut down for a while, presumably, the, at least the surface layers of the ocean would have gone more anaerobic. Um, has anyone modeled that, that it would be atmospheric? I don't know. They and certainly have, have modeled systems like that going back to earlier times as to what you, what you kind of chemistry you will get. Uh, there's the Black Sea, by the way, in case you didn't know, does not have a, an interior, anything like any other sea. It's stratified. There's no circulation. And there are huge areas with no oxygen in them underneath. And uh, it, it just, because of the way it's configured, the winds and so forth, there's nothing to stir it up. And so it's a whole different, uh, different sea environment from any of the others. But I don't know what, what would have, might have happened here. I don't know if things like the Gulf Stream would have changed or if the circulation of the oceans would have changed or anything. All, all good questions. A lot we don't know, obviously. Yeah? If you said that um, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the creatures in the sea survived, but I don't know, you said that the initial impact generated a lot of heat, mm -hmm. and I would have thought, like, well, okay, if a lot of heat is generated, wouldn't that have boiled mm -hmm. the oceans, and then mm -hmm. that would have, like, started like, something else? Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, the answer is that, uh, that it would have heated the surface, but, but only 
little tiny layer because it only lasted 15 minutes, this blast of material. It allows you, by the way, to have a beautiful answer for people who talk about how long did it take the dinosaurs to go extinct. The answer is about 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. It truly was catastrophic. It happened in an afternoon or evening or sometime because of this firestorm. Uh, but, but it was just like a flash on the ocean, and that would not have really made much difference to the critters living there. Well, let me go on and talk about the next thing. And that is when the next one of these is going to happen. One thing about the dinosaurs, they didn't see it coming. They did not have a space program. They did not have a planetary defense program. Uh, there was absolutely nothing they could have done even if they had seen it coming. We're different. We can worry about the next mass extinction from space and what we could do about it. Um, actually, what we worry about, what we've been able to do something about, are much smaller impacts. Not something 15 kilometers across, but an impactor one or two kilometers across, which is still enough to ruin your whole day. Uh, it, uh, it's kind of amazing, because that's not very big. We're talking about something roughly the size of the Stanford campus. Uh, and yet that would blast enough dust into the atmosphere to produce a sort of mini, uh, sometimes called an impact winter. Not mass extinctions, but it would play hell with crops. And you might ask yourself, how long would we survive if for one year there was so much dust in the atmosphere that there were no crops? Any idea how much food we have in storage? Roughly three months worth. Probably more if you, if you slaughtered the animals. I mean, there's a lot of food on the hoof. But it really would be a problem in the, in the tropics where there are High population density, they get two or three crops a year of rice. There's not much in storage. Uh, so if you could have something happen that would just block out agriculture for a, a, a year, it would certainly be catastrophic for human civilization. Not a mass extinction, but catastrophic. And there are a lot of asteroids out there a kilometer across. So what I <laughs> and a few other people started back in 1989, before almost any of you were born, was to estimate the frequency with which the Earth is hit by these objects and ask if we could do anything about it. Actually, we asked the question first and then it came back formally. The U.S. Congress asked NASA to study the issue of whether this was a contemporary risk and how important was it and, uh, and what could we do about it. And I chaired that first NASA study. Um, let me pass these out. I want you to look at, uh, at this graph. So pass them around. And this is what we sometimes call a notional graph. It's, uh, it's not real data plotted. It's uh, approximations. And it's used to get a general idea of how often we're hit by objects of different size. Uh, and you notice, first of all, I haven't listed the sizes. What's listed across the bottom is the energy. The energy in megatons, the unit we use for nuclear bombs. Millions of tons of TNT. And then on the left, the average frequency with which something like that hits the Earth. So let's start with the, uh, the Cretaceous extinction. I didn't tell you this, but you can estimate it was 100 million megatons of energy. And uh, according to this, it's marked KT down here, because Cretaceous is spelled with a K instead of a C in German, a little bit of esoteria. Uh, that's roughly once every 100 million years. Not, not regularly, not periodic, but roughly. Um, this thing marked Tunguska. I'm sure many of you at least have heard about the impact that took place on June 30th, uh, 1908 in Siberia on the Tunguska River. That's the only wit thing we witnessed of a big atmospheric explosion. Uh, roughly 10 megatons. It was about the size of our, our city killer nuclear bombs that we have on our warheads. 
Uh, it happened in the wilderness, so nobody was killed. Um, that should happen once every few centuries on Earth, on average. Um, and and you know, we, we did quite a bit of studies to fill this in. The one on the upper right is interesting. That's something as big as the atom bomb dropped on Hiroshima. And when my colleague Clark Chapman and I first calculated this thing in 1990, we said, wait a minute. According to this, something the size of the Hiroshima bomb must hit the Earth every year. And that led to something that research scientists often experience called an oh shit moment. <laughs> I did something wrong. That's counterintuitive. If the Earth had an impact the size of Hiroshima every year, uh, wouldn't we know about it? Wouldn't everybody know about it? Wouldn't it be in the newspapers? And so you think, oh gosh, I must have done a badly wrong calculation or something. Until we thought about it some more and realized that that size impactor never makes it to the surface. It actually explodes very high in the atmosphere. So it does no harm. And therefore, you don't read about it in the newspapers. But we still ask ourselves, well, look, is there any way we can verify this? And it turned out there was. This was just after the end of the Cold War. The Soviet Union had ceased to exist. The military were a little more open with things. And they have the Earth surrounded with surveillance satellites that are constantly looking down to detect clandestine nuclear explosions, rocket launches, whatever. All highly classified, of course. But uh, if there were these explosions taking place in the outer atmosphere, they should see them. We on the ground might not notice them, but these down-looking systems that are scanning the whole Earth should. And uh, we had a couple of friends in the Pentagon. One of them, Pete Warden, the current director of Ames Research Center, and Lynn and my boss. And uh, they decided to give us some access to that information. Several of us went off to... Uh, Falcon Air Force Base, outside Colorado Springs, the headquarters for the Space Command. Fancy place. Barbed wire, dogs, guards, everything around it. Uh, and in here are all these, these people and computers and data systems. And so we talked to the people that actually monitored the explosions that they saw. And I mean, a simplified dialogue was, do you ever see any single unexpected explosions in the atmosphere? Answer, yes. Well, do you know what they are? Sure, they're meteors. We've known about this for 20 years. In fact, they built their software to discriminate against it because they were looking for bombs and nuclear attacks and not for meteors. But we got enough information out of that to verify this, that something about the size of Hiroshima hits the Earth's atmosphere roughly once a year. So what a plot like this does is tell you how big a problem is it. We calculate this global catastrophe number as being an impact that was just large enough to produce this sort of mini nuclear winter thing. And uh, that was turned out to be the greatest danger because the whole Earth was at risk. A smaller one could wipe out a city, but only at that size and larger could you uh, affect the whole planet. And we worked that out in the early 1990s. And we said that size, a kilometer or larger, is detectable by our telescopes. And we proposed a space guard survey of telescopes to catalog those objects, to discover them and catalog them. Not just discover them at the last minute as they're coming in on Earth, but to actually find them decades in advance. Because anything that's going to hit us will come by over and over and over, repeatedly near the Earth, because their orbits just intersect and cross the orbit of the Earth. And in 1998, we got NASA to agree to start this survey with a budget of $4 million a year. And it's gone for the last 12 years. And the new budget that just came out this week from NASA increases that from four to 20 million. The first time NASA has ever acknowledged that this was a serious issue worth doing something about. We've been operating on a shoestring. In fact, one of the statements that I made long ago that is frequently quoted 
is that the total number of people on planet Earth wor working to protect us from an impact is equivalent to about one shift of McDonald's restaurant. We're going to be able to go up to four shifts at a McDonald's restaurant with this kind of money. Um, and so the other side shows you our progress. There are two curves plotted here. Uh, the lower one, the light colored one, is the asteroids larger than one kilometer. And the other one is all the asteroids that are seen, near Earth asteroids. So that includes smaller ones as well. Um, the goal was to find 90% of those larger than one kilometer by the end of 2008. We found 80% still pretty good. We found about 800. And you might ask, none of you is, but I'm going to pretend at least that some of you are asking yourself, how the heck do you know when you've found 80% or 90%? How do you know what you haven't found? How do you judge the progress of a survey like this? And it's kind of neat what you do. Imagine that you start out on day one, you build your telescopes, you start the survey, you don't know anything about the asteroids up there, and you start discovering them. Each one you discover will be new, right? You haven't done the survey before. Flash forward eight years later, you're still doing the same exact kind of survey with the same telescopes, but now you find that 80% of them that you see are old ones that you're rediscovering, not new ones. That tells you you're 80% done. As it, and it, you know, it's as though the thing becomes less and less efficient. You've already found so many that there aren't very many left to find. And that's how we know where we are in this survey. For the smaller one, and, and by the way, you can also tell it from the way this, this rolls over. The rate of increase rolls over as you get more nearly complete. And the good news is not one of these objects we found is going to hit the Earth at least in the next century or two. There is nothing out there like what did in the dinosaurs. We just about reached the point where we can say there's nothing out there that could even produce a, uh, an impact winter. Um, there are still plenty of things big enough to wipe out a city, but as far as the Earth as a planet is concerned, there is no significant danger from undiscovered objects. And that, I think, is a great accomplishment. I'm sure there are people in Congress who would say that means we've wasted all the money because we didn't find anything that was a danger. Uh, but I think we've done pretty well, and the issue now is whether we should look for smaller ones as well. Uh, could we ever reach the point where we could predict the next tunguska size impact? Uh, the problem is there are a million asteroids out there the size of the one of the Tunguska blast. I don't know. I don't know. I, I didn't ask for it for exactly. It's an awkward number. It's not enough to build the next generation of big telescope. But we don't need just more of the little telescopes we have now. But I bet we'll think of something to do with it. <laughs> yes, right. Yeah. So you talk about um, like these asteroids circling the Earth multiple times now. Is there ever a, like the issue of like, something just coming out of left field and completely? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Like destroying everything we've done. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about statistics, really. Uh, we'll never be sure we found the last one. We'll never be sure there might not be one in a really peculiar orbit that doesn't come by very often. Um, so you improve your odds, but you can never be 100% sure. And you can never protect against the the odd comet coming from deep space with no warning at all. So we've reduced the risk. We haven't put it to zero. Even at the level of that odd comet, it's still possible that something could hit the Earth and produce a mass extinction. Yeah. How much warning do you think we'd have for that odd comet? <coughs> a couple years. Because you don't see them until they come in the inner solar system. Whereas the asteroids that live in the inner solar system, you have chances every year to pick them up. Is there any evidence of that having happened earlier in Earth's history? 
of what having happened? Of a extra um, source, a comment from outside of the solar system. Well, I told you that there were five mass extinctions, and only one has been identified clearly as an impact, the one that did in the dinosaurs. And that's from just the last 500 million years. We know nothing about what happened earlier. So it seems likely that it would have happened. But you know, you, you as you work back in time, you recede into the place where there aren't any data. That's one reason we studied the moon, is to help us figure out what happened in the early history of the Earth. So I could you know, estimate how likely it is, uh, but I can't tell you one way or another. Yeah. Whichever, both of you. Okay. Uh, well, you, you made the division between the large NEAs and all at, with, at one kilometer diameter. Mm -hmm. I was curious, where does that sort of fall in this graph? Where it says global catastrophe. Mm -hmm. We first of all wanted to find all of them were big enough to produce a global catastrophe. And then you begin to worry about those that might just wipe out a country. <laughs> So for the yearly Hiroshima size ones you said they detect, do you know roughly what those diameters are? Uh, yes, they're, they're uh, about, um, oh, Hiroshima. Uh, yeah, about three meters. Really small. Yeah. Yes. Um, so what about the chances for a near-Earth uh, near object, uh, asteroid to, I don't know, like dip below our satellite level and you know, perhaps cause some chaos with our community? Well, we'll find out on, uh, April, on Friday, April 13th, 2029, when a quite substantial asteroid called Apophis, 300 meters long, will do just that. It'll come so close, it'll be inside the, uh, the, uh, the ring of communication satellites, it'll be easily visible to the naked eye going across the sky. It will be the biggest thing that's ever come that close since astronomers started. But fortunately, it won't hit. Yeah. So how close is close? Because I'm seeing like missed distances of like 20 miles, like every day, basically in all these near Earth objects. But like, how close does it have to be before? You know, it either misses or it hits. Uh, and. Uh, but at what point do you start getting worried, based on like the calculated missed distance? Well, you know, it, what it depends, of course, is the uncertainty in that calculation. When we first found Apophis. I knew it was coming close to the Earth in 2029. The initial orbits were uncertain enough that we thought it might hit. It was a big deal. For about a day and a half, those first calculations made it look like it had a one chance in 20 of hitting the Earth. And we were faced with the question of whether we should call the press or what we should do, because we wanted more data. We wanted to check it. And, uh, Indeed, new data came in a couple of days later, and we were very sure it would miss. But when you first calculate an orbit, it's very uncertain. And as you get more and more observations, the orbit becomes more certain. Uh, what about Apophis's <coughs> second approach in 2036, at least the one I've heard of? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's much more interesting. Oh. <laughs> the uh, Apophis comes so close in 2029 that the gravity of the Earth really changes its orbit. In fact, it goes from an orbit being primarily inside the Earth's orbit to an orbit primarily on the outside. Basically, it's getting energy from the Earth and changing its orbit. And we don't know what orbit it will end up with after that. And one of them would allow it to come back seven years later and hit the Earth. Because you have to know with extreme precision how close it's coming to the Earth in 2029 to calculate its sub, its post-encounter orbit and see if it's coming back. We don't think it is. But that's what makes it sort of the poster boy asteroid. Because uh, it is complicated. Even though we know it'll miss the first time, the uncertainty about what happens afterwards allows for other possibilities. Yeah. How would, that, how would that impact, like, where would that be on? Where would Apophis fit there? It would be a little smaller than the uh, global catastrophe. The global catastrophe is one kilometer in diameter. Apophis is 300 meters. So uh, in here. But you see, there's, there's, let me explain because it is kind of interesting. This side is science. This is the way science operates. You 
sample and you calculate and you calculate odds and you know that's not what people want to hear. They don't want to hear if there's a one in 500,000 chance of being hit in two years or something. They want us quite specifically to tell them where and when the next impact will take place. None of this damn statistics, but actually predict it. And so that's why we have the space current survey. We're going to find every object one at a time and calculate its orbit. People don't want to know <coughs> what the chances are. For many years, I was known as Dr. Doom because I was out here pushing this issue that there really was a chance of a catastrophic impact by an asteroid. Not that it was about to happen, that we were predicting it, but it was something worth doing something about. And so I was Dr. Doom, and I kept saying, you know, the, the sky is falling, they're coming, we've got to do something. We did do something. And I have been shocked to realize that now, far from being Dr. Doom, I'm just the opposite. I'm trying to deal with a blizzard of what I call cosmophobia. People who are afraid of the sky, who are afraid of astronomy. Now, it would be none of you, it may not be a large fraction of the population, but it's significant enough that for the last two years I've been receiving about two dozen email questions a day from such people. And they started out with just, will the world end on December 21st, 2012? Will we all die? And as time's gone on, it's much, much more specific. And now I get them about things I've never heard of. I got one two days ago. Someone said, is T. Pixidus going to go nova and kill us all in two years? And why won't you tell us the truth? <laughs> I've never heard of the star. And other people said, I'm, I can't sleep at night. I'm afraid of Betelgeuse. You know, the red star in Orion. It sounds funny, but this is, is, it's a strange phenomenon. But I just want to look specifically at 2012, just to give you an, an analysis of the kind of pseudoscience that's out there. Where on earth did the idea come that the world was going to end on December 21st, 2012? Yeah. That's not actually where it started. But yes, that, that gives you the date. The start is, is more crazy yet. Um, the, uh, there's a man named Zachariah Sitkin who claims that he has found ancient Sumerian clay tablets and translated them that no one else knows about and no one else can translate. He claims he speaks seven languages and all of these things, and he started writing books back in the 70s. He tells that these tablets told him that, uh, that the Sumerian civilization, which was, you know, some say the first civilization in Mesopotamia, uh, that there were were extraterrestrial visitors, aliens that came and helped them establish their civilization. And these came from a planet called Nibiru, which is a companion of the solar system and comes into the inner solar system every 3,600 years and wreaks havoc. Um, and is due to come back soon. He's written six or eight books on the subject. He's basically made his career out of what I call science fiction. But that was where the idea of this Nibiru thing, because Nibiru is a minor god in, in a couple of the Mesopotamian epics. Uh, not even clear whether it was ever associated with a planet or what, but it's, a, it's a more a companion god to Marduk. Um, but that's not what Sitkin says. He's got all this other story, ancient astronauts, and alien visits, and all that. Then the next step was a woman named Nancy Leader who is one of the, uh, the internet psychics. And what she has done, she claims, is she is in constant mental contact with aliens on a star, a planet around the star Zeta Reticuli, whom she calls Zetans. And that they warned her that the Earth was going to be damaged or destroyed by an incoming planet, Nibiru. And it was going to happen on March 23rd, 2003. And so for the year or two before, I was all over the internet. It's coming. We've been warned. This planet is going to come and destroy the Earth. Um, even up to one week before the predicted date, she was still saying on her website that it was coming. 
that we couldn't see it, but it was coming. Well, I think you probably all know the Earth was not destroyed on March 23, 2003. Oddly enough, she just recycled it and said, oh no, that was wrong, it's really happening on December 21, 2012. And then we come to the Mayan calendar. Uh, the Mayan calendar, I'm no expert on, but it, it is a day counting calendar. It doesn't have months, things like that. It has cycles like the period of Venus and the period between eclipses. And they're just hundreds or thousands of days that you count up. And the long count, uh, I think, amounts to several thousand years. And that's you know, the longest number of days. And so you go through this and you find that somewhere about 2012, this long count, the current long count comes to an end and a new one starts. It's happened before. It's, it's, uh, I mean, it's just like your desk calendar. My desk calendar ends on December 31st of 2010, but I don't think that's the end of the world. I think the next calendar will start the day after. The Mayans said nothing about this being the end of the world. It was just the end of a block of time the way they calculated it. But what people did was put together these three things. Nancy Leader's warning from the aliens around the stars Zeta Reticuli, Zachariah Sitkin's fake translation of uh, Sumerian documents, and the end of the Mayan long count, and says those all are happening on, in December 2012, and that will be the end of the world. And then it goes on. They find it elsewhere. They say it's in the Bible. That's what the Bible describes as the end of the world. It's in the I Ching. Uh, Nostradamus predicted it. Um, this is, of course, a completely non-scientific attitude because these people believed that the ancients could predict something like a planet going to come and hit the Earth. And a lot of my questions are that way. It's really hard to answer. Somebody says, but the Mayan calendar was the most precise calendar humans have ever calculated. How can you... Why would you question uh, their prediction that the world would end now? Well, you know, to me, calendars don't predict anything except keep, keeping track of days. Mm -hmm. um, and, but, but they claim that all of these things, the Bible, Nostradamus, the I Ching, the Mayans, I don't know what else, are all converge on December 21st, 2012, as being the end of the world. And a lot of what's still going on is Nibiru, this planet. It is quite remarkable, the stories about it. It's said to have been hiding behind the sun for the last three years, so that astronomers couldn't see it. Now, I don't know if any of you have thought about orbits, but you can't, as the Earth goes around the sun, you can't have something else constantly staying on the back of it. How do we know this? Because you can photograph it. And I will challenge any of you, you must all have cell phone uh, cameras. Too late today, but on the next sunny day, go out and point the camera at the sun and take a picture. And there's a pretty good chance you'll get a picture of Nibiru, because that's the way optics work. When you point at one very bright source, there'll be an internal reflection that will produce a faint copy of it diametrically across the center. And so thousands and thousands and thousands of people have been out there seeing Nibiru by using their cell phone cameras to photograph the sun. Um, at the same time, apparently as no contradiction, they say it's visible in the night sky. And this last summer, it was the brightest thing in the night sky. And, the, uh, and I mean, people said things like, in my neighborhood, a number of people are out with their telescopes tonight looking at Nibiru. Well, it was Jupiter they were looking at. <laughs> uh, but it's a, it's a very interesting mindset that for both the people with the cell phone cameras and the telescope that they think they can see something in the sky easily, something bright, that 100,000 astronomers have missed. Now, a lot of it, of course, is accusations of, of government cover-up. It's all part of the big conspiracy theory. And I try to explain to people that astronomers are not the same as the government, that even if the government wanted to cover something up, I don't pretend to think they would, how could they do it? An, a, new planet in the sky would have been visible to at least 100,000 amateur astronomers all over the world in 125 countries. I mean, how could NASA or the government keep that a secret? It would be known by anybody with a telescope. It would be all over the internet. But they say, no, no, it's a big conspiracy, and it's really there, and you're just not willing to tell us because what? <laughs> 
Why do you think we aren't willing to tell them? Yes, it's going to create panic. And so we're, we're willing, according to them, to let the population of the Earth die rather than tell them about it and risk panic. Um, you know, if you actually told them that the apoptosis was the near root and just here it comes, they'd probably give up on the thing. So yeah, maybe. It's official, it's coming. That's right. You know, if, if I said it was true, then since I work for the government, uh, that would mean it isn't, right? Um, Yeah, well, well there, there have been interesting versions of that. You all know Jesse Ventura, the former uh, governor of Minnesota, former professional wrestler. He started a new, uh, I think it's on the History Channel, a new show called Conspiracy Theory. And so he's been going around. He says that the government is building huge underground cities. Uh, that, for instance, under the whole Denver airport is a city that can hold hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, for escaping. And of course, they see it on TV, and if it's on TV, it must be true. Um, and the fact that these things are not being written up in the regular newspapers and CBS News just means it's part of the conspiracy. Um, the most extreme, well, well, let me just, I can quote directly one person who wrote to me. He said, We know that you, meaning me, the government, you are building shelters where you will all escape, leaving the, uh, using our tax money to build shelters where you can escape, leaving the rest of us on the surface to die. May you rot in the hell you have made for yourself. <laughs> Makes you feel good to get an email message like that. Um, and then I, I've told you that this cosmophobia, it gets transferred to all these other things. Another part of the phenomenon is a so-called alignment. The claim is that the planets will all be aligned on December 21st, 2012. Now, it's real easy to check that if you have any of these software programs that you know, c calculates where planets are. There's no sort of alignment at all. Um, but this is something that I hadn't realized either. You probably experienced it. There are an awful lot of people out there that think an alignment, a celestial alignment, must be important, that the gravitational pull all lines up and so if there were several planets in line, it must affect the Earth. But it doesn't. Also, on December 21st, they say the Sun is aligned with the center of the galaxy, where there's a black hole 30,000 light years away. Well, that must be important, because that black hole lined up with the Sun will surely cause a catastrophe on Earth. Um, anyway, it just goes on and on. And, and I've been all this list, people, uh, people are beginning to get the idea Nibiru really isn't there. I mean, you know, it's, only, it's less than three years away. It, by any orbit you can imagine, if this thing were coming into the inner solar system, it would already be a naked eye object. Uh, so I think gradually the Nibiru interest is going down, but not the alignment interest, not the black hole in the center of the galaxy. There are people who are afraid of black holes. There are people who are afraid of the galactic plane. And when the solar system goes through the galactic plane, that will surely produce a catastrophe. And so I just uh, find it fascinating and a little appalling because the, there's no scientific thought in this at all. And yet it's there. I mean, I've had several people say, my son's science teacher taught them about this in grade school. Or uh, my neighbors are building a bomb shelter in the, back, in the back of their yard so they can survive. There's a group that says that the only place that will be safe on Earth will be in, in a part of Africa. And guess what? They're selling lots there. Uh, there are more than 300 books listed on Amazon.com on the subject of the 2012 catastrophe. And uh, I'm not Dr. Doom anymore. I'm trying to point out that the world out there is fascinating, astronomy is fascinating, and you shouldn't be afraid of it. And it's very sad that people are, that they, you know, they, they hear about almost anything. I'll give you one more example. One of the interesting discoveries three or four months ago was a thing the astronomers dubbed, dubbed a suicidal planet. It was one of these external planets found around a star, uh, a big one, much bigger than Jupiter, in a really fast orbit. It went around in one day. 
And of course, that means there were all sorts of tides and things. Its orbit was decaying. Sometime in the next million years, it will crash into the planet, into the star, and be gone. So it was called a suicidal planet. Very next day, I got two questions saying, when the suicidal planet crashes into the sun, will it also destroy the Earth? Wait a minute. The sun? This is some distant star system. It's not something in our solar system. But they didn't quite get that. The reason it's sad is that some people are taking it very seriously. I've had a dozen young people write to me and say they couldn't sleep, they couldn't study, what was the purpose of life, everything was going to end. I've had three teenagers say they were planning suicide before it happened because they didn't want to be here for the end of the world. I've had three women, young women, say they were planning to kill their children and themselves before it happened because they didn't want to witness the catastrophe. I had one sort of sad letter. This is what it said. It said, I'm so frightened. My only friend is my little dog, Wheezy, and I want to know when I should put her to sleep so she won't suffer in the catastrophe. Now, any of you talk to people who believe this stuff? When I asked you at the bidding how many had heard of 2012, like several of you put up your hands. Where do you hear about it? I'm curious. I really want to know because it's, it's a culture I don't intersect with. Are these things that, that people talk about on the bus? Are you, is it on the radio? Where are you hearing about it? Yeah. I say I'm, uh, I'm an astrophysics major. They say, oh, oh, so have you heard of blank? Uh-huh. <laughs> do, do you, you have, have an answer? answer? Yes. I say, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. They don't believe me. Uh-huh. You're part of the conspiracy then. Is NASA paying you to, to, be, to, uh, to tell lies about this? I wish they were. Yes. Right. <laughs> Yeah? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering where most of the people who send those emails are writing from. Do, you, do they write? Do they uh, no, one of the things, probably you wouldn't realize this because there certainly is a little bit of paranoia. The government is not allowed to, to identify and keep track of, of the people that write to us. Um, so we have no addresses. We can maybe infer their age if they say, I'm a 16 year old boy and. Uh, but we don't know. You can try to look at, at the, some of the things they say, and it's gotten to the point where about half the questions are now from India, or India, Pakistan, you know, that area, uh, which is, after all, the biggest English-speaking part of the world. Uh, and uh, I've certainly gotten them from other specific places. I mean, I have had reporters from Russia say, you know, it's a big deal in Russia. They're all predicting this coming. The scientists are saying it's true. Really? The Russian scientists say this is true? Yeah? That's what I am, Abby. Uh, I did do one thing because it was clear that most of the source of information of these people is not even the internet, it's YouTube. And so I did a YouTube video. If you want to want to go, you can see my four minute YouTube video trying to answer this because, uh, you know, you got tired of posting things that nobody reads, and, uh, and you go to YouTube and you will see a thousand, two thousand, three thousand videos by people, many of them claiming to be from NASA, who are talking about the 2012 catastrophe. And many of them, of course, are trying to sell you something. Any more questions on any of this? Lynn, I'll turn it back to you. Well, two quick things if you want to address it. When you write in and to the Ask an Astrobiologist column, someone asked about Dear Abby, um, that's exactly who you get is Dr. Morse. Yeah, I should have said that. That's how come I started getting these notes. They were sent to the Ask an Astrobiologist. And, and the, the you know, two dozen I got a day are still that, and I still got a few real questions about astrobiology. And obviously I don't spend very much time answering these because they're so repetitious. It's the same thing over and over and over. When the planets align, blah, blah, blah. When the sun is at the center of the Milky Way, blah, 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 etc. But since all of you are taking astrobiology, no doubt you will be asked these questions in your future, so you need to know this. Did you make a frequently asked questions section? Oh, I sure do. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll make sure that this is all linked into yeah. the, the course mm -hmm. website. I think the Ask an Astrobiologist is already on the astrobiology.com. Yeah, yeah it, it, needless to say, this is one of the most popular websites in NASA. And uh, 
And I have answered only a time. I've received more than 3,500 questions so far on 2012. And I've posted answers to about 300. And I've done this YouTube video. And you know, I've, I've been the only scientist out there answering um, until recently. Now some of the others are. And my scientist friends think I'm crazy. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.